Welcome to this episode of the White House 1600 Sessions. I'm Stuart McLaurin, president of the White House Historical Association. And you're probably wondering, where is he? What is this house behind him? We have a really special treat for you today. This is a home in Alexandria, Virginia, where the Ford family, President and Mrs. Ford, and their four children lived when President Ford was a member of Congress, and then when he was vice president, and in the early weeks of the presidency, this was the White House. The President of the United States lived in this house. There was a Secret Service place. One of the local garages was for the press set up. And we're going to hear from my great friend, Susan Ford Bales. Come on, Susan, join us here. And we're going to talk about her memories here in this neighborhood, growing up in this house, and then a little bit about the presidency. So we literally just drove up five minutes ago. And, and along the way from the airport, Susan was pointing out things that she remembered. But first time you've been at this house in how long? Four years. And you drive up here, and what, what are the memories that come to mind? That's my bedroom window. <laughs> wow. How many times did you sneak out of that bedroom window? I didn't. We all went out Steve's bedroom window because <laughs> okay. there's a porch behind it. <laughs> That's great. You have memories of growing up here as a family and your mom and dad, not as necessarily a congressman or a vice president or as a president, but as a family. And you were in a neighborhood, and you went to school in this neighborhood. And so this is a lot of your home and your roots. Tell us your recollections of that time in your life? Well, this is the only house I ever lived in mm. until I moved to the White House. So I came home here as a baby and lived here until I was 17 years old. So uh, um, lots of memories. Your father becomes vice president and then president. And what was that like having all of a sudden you're in your family home with the president of the United States? Well, let go back to being vice president because Sam Donaldson pretty much parked himself in our front yard <laughs> for weeks. And my mother was, the. our phone number was in the phone book because that's what you did as a congressional wow. person. And so they called every hour. So is there anything to know? Are you going to tell us anything? It was awful. Mm. And this was building up to Nixon's resignation in Well, it was August starting of off with Spiro Agnew oh, resigning and my dad being the vice president. Mm. And so the neighbors were serving martinis in their yard to the press. I mean, it was it was really a wonderful thing to do. It's what oh, what you do as right, neighbors for each right. other. And you were in high school. I was in time. high school then. Yeah. Well, wow. so what did your friends think of you as a daughter of a vice president and then as a president? Well, you know, school? it's it's funny. Some of the kids that lived in the neighborhood came and stayed at the house when mom and dad went to the White House. Mm -hmm to do the whole thing and because they had been my friends forever. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we were still the Fords. We were still the same family that had been here for years. Mm. And everybody was just kind and generous and welcoming. And, you know, you couldn't have asked any better. Well, there's a plaque here that commemorates <laughs> this as a historic landmark. And so it's a historic landmark for the family and for White House history, not just uh, the Ford family, but for the American family as well, and so unique that we have the opportunity to talk about this is a place where the president lived other than the White House before he could move in and your mother could move in. So let's go inside and talk more about your memories. And Can't wait to see. You've not been in yet. So no, this I is haven't. Be this will be interesting. So, so here we go. Thanks. This is now a private home that's no longer owned by the Ford family. The current owners have been very kind to let us visit. So here we are, Susan. We're coming into the house. This is the first time you've been in here in 40 years. Yes. Feelings. It's just, it's, it's home. Wow, you can feel it. Let's go into here. I think there's some pictures in this space that are uh, really important to look at. Take a look at the wall in here and okay. reflect on, on some of these images, what you see. Well, there's dad in the pool, which I know doesn't exist anymore. And then mother uh, was obviously in the newspaper for fashion or whatever. And a lot of that furniture in that picture has been divided up between us kids, wow, but it still, still exists. Wow. Yeah. What about does. this picture over here with your mom? That was taken of us in the backyard before the swimming pool was built. And that dress was lavender. <laughs> Why do I remember that? I don't know. That's great. Well, let's walk into the kitchen. Now, this is an important family space. Does it bring back uh, any particular memories from your childhood? Oh, it does. It does. I want to say we, our dishwasher was over here, but hey, I give them credit that they've redone the kitchen because it uh -huh. needed it. 
Um, but my brother Steve's bedroom was right above here. And so we would step down to get to escape out of his bedroom <laughs> to sneak that out was at night. Patch? Yes. And the Smiths lived back there. So That's that was... Uh, was your mom a good cook? She was a great cook. Wow. So you had family dinner around this table? We did. We was, did. And your father was in the Congress. Was it late nights getting home? Or what do you remember oh, about usually, that Oh, usually. Yeah, it was usually late nights, you know, when you're lobbying and mm -hmm. trying to get bills passed and things mm -hmm. like that. Plus, he traveled almost 250 days a year when he was a congressman. So wow. there were a lot of mom and just the kids for dinner. Wow. But Sunday night was always family night. Wow. And so Sunday night, we always had family dinners. So you lived in this house for about 17, 17 years? 17 years. Wow. That's incredible. So, and have not been back since no, you moved no. out. It, it looks great. The, wow. That good old brick wall. There's many pictures of our high chairs in front of that wall. <laughs> That's great. So Susan, we're in a room that was the family den, the gathering place. Uh, so you can, I'm sure, hear echoes of memories in this space. But there's one memory I want to bring to mind and have you tell us the story. There had to be a hotline or a phone when your father was vice president. <laughs> yes. And tell us where that was and how that would be answered. And I think you would receive the call. I he did. Was asked well, to be... I, I ran up the stairs to get the, the call right, because right. dad had said, uh, whoever is going to be the vice president is going to get a call. I don't know, 6.30, 7.30, you know, details. Mm -hmm. And so when I heard that phone ring, which was upstairs mm -hmm. on dad's side of the bed, right. I ran upstairs to get it, and I was like, <laughs> Dad, it's the White House. So, And then Dad went up and spoke uh -huh. to President Nixon, and my dad said, could you call back on the other line, mm -hmm. the, the public one that was in the phone book, <laughs> so that Betty could be on the other line oh, and nice. hear. So instead of them trying to share one and phone. And that call took place in your parents' bedroom? Yes. Wow. And then he hangs up the phone and... Is the family here at that, that time? Steve and I were here. Mike mm -hmm. and Jack were off at college, and mm -hmm. Mike was uh, in graduate school. Um, so it was Steve and I were here. And so Mother and I, I had convinced Mother to mm -hmm. pick out a dress that afternoon. I was like, just in case. Oh, that's smart. Let's yeah. be prepared, because she was known for not being punctual. Uh -huh. And so I was trying to help her be a little more punctual. And so... We picked out a dress, and then we all left the table, and she went up to get ready. And while this is happening, there's media camped outside waiting for something to happen. Right. Did your father go out and speak to them, or was there a time later when it was publicly announced that he greeted the press here? No, he, I'm sure, if I remember correctly, he spoke to the press after the announcement mm -hmm. because Dad went to the White House to, to be, Mother and Dad went formal to the White House. Announced. Yeah, for the formal announcement. The call comes, your father's now going to be Vice President of the United States. What is your first question about how your life is going to change? I'm not even thinking that yet. Because you see, we didn't have a vice presidential residence. Oh. So this was going to be the vice sure, president's sure. house. There was and not it, the Naval Observatory right. so for the this vice president was, like we have today. Right. right. And eventually we had to put, not we, the government put bulletproof windows in, mm -hmm. which have since been removed. Mm -hmm. The garage got turned into a Secret Service command post. Mm -hmm. Now there's not a garage to this house. So there were changes and then there were boosts. You know, what people would think of this phone booth out in your backyard yes. for Secret Service posts. So it wow. changed very quickly. Wow. Very quickly. And you were in high school during I was a junior in high years. school. And did the Secret Service start going with you to high school? No, they didn't. Because back then, the mm -hmm. second lady and the family did not get protection. Mm. And I didn't get protection until there was a threat from the SLA. And yes. my name was below Patty Hearst. Yes. And so I got protection before my mother got protection. Interesting. And I had to move out of boarding school and move home. How was that explained to you at the time about the threat? And the thing is, they didn't mention my name. They just said the vice president's daughter. Mm -hmm. So there was, there was only one of those. Well, but the Agnews also had mm -hmm. a daughter. Mm -hmm. So they didn't know I which see. daughter it was. Mm -hmm. And they were just like, you're going to have to have protection now. And I had come home for the weekend from boarding school. Mm -hmm. And um, my life changed. Right. Nothing was spontaneous. Everything had to be planned. Mm -hmm. And I was not good at that. 
Hmm. <laughs> a junior in high school? Are you kidding me? <laughs> well, let's sit down and uh, delve more into the story. Okay. So, Susan, we've settled here in the family living room, and I understand there was a famous interview with Dick Cavett and your father when he was vice president. So I'm not up to the Dick Cavett level, <laughs> but I'll pretend and we'll have a good conversation. So tell us about this space. I know that this mantle has appeared in quite a few family photographs. We did many Christmas card pictures in front of this. And before there was a door to this back porch, which is lovely, was my mother's wing chair and my dad's chair. And uh, there were many pictures taken there also. The piece of furniture that used to sit in that corner uh, is at my daughter's house. So, you know. Now, your father was a famous a pipe smoker. Mm -hmm. And the story is that he would use that as a to contemplate, to give a pause. <laughs> yes. So uh, people would wait for his answer to something and he would take a puff on the pipe. Did he smoke his pipe here around the house? And is that a fragrance memory that you have in this house? It is, and his blue leather chair, which is in my daughter's house now, used to sit in that corner. And his humidor, I have. Mm. And he smoked Field and Stream, and for some reason that blue can sticks mm -hmm. out in my mind. But he would come in at night or after dinner and sit in there and, and read his papers, because my dad read five papers a day. Mm. Um, so... You know, that was back in the day when newspapers were in abundance. And mm -hmm. you only had three channels, That's right. ABC, NBC, That's and CBS. Right. So as a member of Congress, you mentioned that he traveled so much, over 200 days a year. How did he stay in touch with you? How did you stay connected as a family with him on the road so much? Well, he would talk to my mom every night. That was just demanding because she had four young kids, mm -hmm. you got to remember. And I mean, there were occasions he would talk to us. He would try and get home on Friday nights because the boys played football. Mm -hmm. And so he would go to their football games and I usually tagged along. But you know, the neighborhood really kept up with each other and kept an eye on mother. Mm -hmm. We also had a wonderful housekeeper for 20, 25 years, Clara who was here five days a week to help my mother so that mother could go do the Senate Wives Club things and the luncheons and the... And she also went up to dad's congressional office and would give tours to Michiganders. Oh, really? That's terrific. To stay in touch with the constituents. Right. I mean, it's so different now. So different now. Well, you had three older brothers. You were the youngest of four children, the only girl. Your brothers played football, and that was a bonding element with your dad, I'm sure. What was your connection with your dad? What was your relationship like with him? Well, I started riding horses. And so we would drive out to Fairfax, which back then was the boondocks. <laughs> right, a road trip. <laughs> it was a road trip to go out to Fairfax. And so he would drive me out to my riding lessons on the weekends. And he would sit in the car and read his newspapers while I was having my lesson. But we'd have the time in the car going out and the time coming home. Mm -hmm. And then the church we attended was just up the street. Mm -hmm. When dad was home... We made really special time for it, mm -hmm. and it was important to be together as a family. Mm. And then there was the swimming pool. Yeah, you've mentioned the swimming pool several times, so that must have been a hub of activity for four Ford kids. It was. Um, mother wouldn't let Dad build it until I was five. That's smart. And he said she's got to be able to swim before you, we put a, a pool in the backyard. Mm -hmm. And there were also many parties the old Chowder and Marching gang would come over here for parties. And that's how you got to know all the different congressmen and senators and, and things like that. But my dad swam twice a day. He'd get up and swim in the morning, and then he'd swim again at night. That was his way of relaxing. And during the period of time that you were in the White House, what was the swimming there? Did you, you uh, Nixon he had built covered a pool. over? He built a pool he built outside. A, he raised the funds, and he built a pool back behind... The Oval Office, That's right. I think the first year it wasn't there, but the second year. And President Nixon had covered over the indoor pool, which is and now made the it the press, press room. room. Right. And so the outdoor pool is where your father would do his daily right. uh, swimming. Your mother and uh, her life as a, a wife of a congressman, then the wife of the vice president living here. Tell us about how she evolved in some of the things that she was dealing with and how that impacted family life? Well, you know, you got to remember as a congressional wife, she was very involved and they always met monthly 
I still have several Congressional Wives cookbooks, which are fabulous cookbooks, by the way. But then also, once she became the second lady, then she became in charge of the Senate Wives Club, which met on a regular basis. And they worked with the Red Cross, if I'm not mistaken. And so they would roll bandages oh, yes, and do right. all kinds of things. Quite a historic role with the Red Cross. Right, right, exactly. And then once she became First Lady, we weren't there more than six weeks before she was diagnosed mm. with breast cancer. Mm. So that started that whole um when she chose to be so open and honest and public mm -hmm. about her breast cancer. so Share with us, if you can, that conversation as a family about taking that public in a transformational way. This is something that we mention now and talk about, but it wasn't talked about at the time. You wouldn't say the word breast publicly. But how did you wrestle with that, or did you wrestle with it as a family, or was it something she was just absolutely going to do? Well, you know, it's interesting. I saw Lucy Johnson a couple of weeks ago uh, down in Austin, and, and Lucy and I were talking because Lady Bird and Lucy and Linda came to the White House that afternoon before Mother went to Bethesda Naval. Mm -hmm. When you look at the pictures, there's a little suitcase at the foot of Mother and Dad's bed, which, of course, nobody noticed. But Lucy's like, your mother was so kind to let us come back to the house and see our rooms. And I said, but the whole thing is, Lucy, you don't get to go back to the house very often. I've only been back once or twice mm -hmm. since we left and to, be able, and to be able to go up into the family quarters and see your rooms. And my mother, because Mrs. Johnson and my mother had been dear friends for so long, was like, no, come back. There had been a dedication of Mrs. Johnson's wildlife down on the parkway. Oh, sure. And so she was like, no, come to the house, have tea, let the girls see the house, blah, blah, you know, one of those situations. But in the pictures is this suitcase because it wasn't announced until mother got to Bethesda that she was going in for surgery. They didn't mm -hmm. say what the surgery was right away. And so she became really an icon to women across the country and around the world who were dealing with this in a quieter way and then they realized, well, they weren't alone in this. When did your mother come to realize the significant impact she had had on this issue and with other women? You know, I don't think she realized the impact for probably at least six months. You know, and then following her was Happy Rockefeller mm. um, was diagnosed with breast cancer. And then Nancy Reagan. I mean, so mother opened that door mm -hmm. so that women were not afraid to go public and share. As my dad said to my mother, I didn't marry you for your breasts. I mean, <laughs> that's just the way, I mean, that's the way they are. Wow. I, I married you for you and it didn't matter. And so he was very proud of her for what she had undertaken. Absolutely. But through. I don't think she had any realize the impact until the letters started pouring in. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the numbers are, but they're astounding. Mm -hmm. The numbers of letters that came into the White House thanking her mm -hmm. for opening that door and being so open mm -hmm. and honest about breast cancer. And even here we are, all of these decades later, she is still known for the impact she had on that. And your work continues with on her behalf. Tell us how you remain involved with that cause. After the White House, about the time that Mother started the Betty Ford Center, she connected with Nancy Brinker. And Nancy and Mother kind of started their organizations together and kind of held each other's hand. Mm -hmm. And Mother helped Nancy out in and, and getting the whole Komen Foundation. And I was just in Florida a couple months ago with Nancy working on the Promise Fund of Florida and, and working with her. It's not going away, and I'm at that god-awful age that my friends are now being sure. diagnosed with breast cancer. Sure. And uh, so I pay very close attention to it. During her time of recovery, you had to step in <laughs> on a couple of ad hoc first lady moments. <laughs> yeah. uh, reflect on that with us. The one that stands out the most in my mind is the diplomatic reception, which is just a dessert and drinks, I guess you would call it. But I had to wear long white gloves and I got my red chiffon dress at Lomans. I don't think Lomans exists anymore. No, but um, when dad heard that I, we spent $50 on the dress, you know, my dad was tighter than a tick, let me just tell you. 
and I think I wore it a couple more times. So I got my fifty dollars worth. But um, <laughs> so I had to wear long white gloves and dance with all these different ambassadors. And you have to remember, I'm a senior in high school, and I didn't know what I was doing. Thank goodness I took Junior Cotillion when I lived here in Alexandria and learned how to waltz and learned how to foxtrot and and all of those things. So it was it was quite a night. Well, speaking of quite a nights, you had the opportunity or the privilege to do something that no other high school seniors had the privilege to do <laughs> in the White House. How did you pull that off? It wasn't even my idea, Stuart. The prom committee came to me and said, would this be a possibility? And I was like, I don't know. So I went to the usher's office, which, you know, Rex Scouton was our oh, usher yes. then. Um, Quite a force to be reckoned with. He was a force to be reckoned with. I got in trouble with Rex a few times. And I asked Rex, and he said, well, I don't know. Let me, you know, have you talked to your parents? And, and my parents were like, if Rex says it's okay, then it's okay. Because he's pretty much, he's the house manager right. is what he is. The school paid, or the class, I should say, I think cost us $1,200 Paid for a the lot food. Of money at that time, it yeah. was a lot of money. 1975. Paid for the food. Paid for the punch. It didn't get spiked, <laughs> of course. The class chose to have teachers be our chaperones that we chose, mm. because there were so many parents, of course, that wanted to be the chaperones, and we were like, no, we're pi <laughs> we're picking our own chaperones. We had two bands. I think one of them decided to do it for free. We tried to get the Beach Boys, but they turned us down. Oh. I don't I don't know why. But it was a great party. It was and a great party. Did your party. parents make an appearance? No, my Aunt Janet came because mother and dad were on a foreign trip. Wow. And so my Aunt Janet was staying up on the third floor with me because my date was staying up there and I had several girlfriends up there. So the third floor was kind of a party house that weekend. <laughs> One of the things that you've uh, said that I've heard is that uh, what a challenge dealing with the press was during that time. Of course, we see that with the press yelling at the president, screaming at the president for questions. And there's been times where they have been more invasive with family and less invasive with family over the years. What was that experience uh, for you like in dealing with the press? Well, it was a new phenomenon, I will tell you that. But to get to my dad's office, I had to walk past the press room to get to the Oval Office from the residence. And my dad had such a good rapport with the press. He always gave them enough to keep them happy, and but never gave the whole story away. So I look back at that and I think he was really talented at that, but I think it came from all his, all his years yeah. in the Congress. But I had some articles written about me and I made the National Enquirer way too many times <laughs> and got me in trouble a few too many times. I didn't trust them. And, you know, the one thing, we were criticized for wearing blue jeans, if that tells you oh, how long wow. ago. We've come a long way. We've come a long way. And Mother and I had fur coats, but back then women wore mm -hmm. fur coats, but we were criticized for wearing fur coats. And um, I would just you know, get furious, and I'd say, but Dad, that's not the way it was written, and, and he'd go, don't give it any more effort, because there's no reason for it to continue in the press, and so he taught me some great lessons. Mm -hmm. It may not be the way the story is supposed to be, but don't give it any more attention, and just let it go, and I'm, yeah. I was like, wow. To me, it was just an attack of my dad's integrity or my integrity mm -hmm. or that sort of thing, and I didn't like that. Well, I've heard many uh, presidents and politicians say, in fact, uh, President Bush 41 would say the attacks that he would hear on his son yeah. as president were harder than the attacks that he had to accommodate of, on himself. And I'm sure it was the same way as a family member when your father's the president. As mother would say, leave my kids alone. They were not voted in. They didn't ask to be here leave them alone. Mm. Because I think my parents had such a good rapport with the press, mm -hmm. they pretty much left us alone. And I had, because I grew up in this town, all my friends were here, so I was pretty well protected by my girlfriends and people like that. Mm. Susan, let's talk about another topic that is difficult but also important, and one where your mother has a significant legacy, and that's with the challenges related to prescription drugs 
and alcohol. Reflect on that evolution in her life and in the public story. Well, I'm, I'm so proud of her for what she did in creating the Betty Ford out in Palm Springs, especially when she's only four years clean and sober. Mm. That's pretty risky early in your sobriety. Mm. And there is another example of her taking something and trying to make it as normal as possible. You know, when I compare it to breast cancer and I compare it to substance use disorder, Breast cancer has gone leaps and bounds. Research, all of that, the money that's been raised, you know, women who are getting treatment who don't normally get treatment, and and men get breast cancer too. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to ignore them. But substance use disorder has not gone leaps and bounds. It's been slow and steady. Yes, research has been helpful, but do we have that magic really bullet? Mm. Um, No, we still don't. I'm very proud to be a part of the Hazleton Betty Ford Foundation Mm -hmm. and continuing her work Mm -hmm. because that's another disease that that has affected me and my life um, and family members and friends and that sort of thing. You can't avoid it. One in four people are touched by substance use Mm -hmm. disorder, so it's hard to be ignored. Um, And I really like my work with that, and I'm very devoted to it. So, but I'm proud of her and I want to continue that legacy for her. And the rawness of the exposure of, at the time and your father in his public visibility eye, was there a feeling on, among his people of any political risk or downside to that, even though it was so important that it be dealt with in a family way? No, there wasn't. Um, and I have never seen two people become such soulmates and work together Mm. as a couple during that because the whole family is affected. We all had to change our lives. We all had to do things differently. Mm. We had to learn about the disease. We had to learn about being codependents and things like that and changed behaviors. But to watch the two of them work together was absolutely amazing as a couple. That's powerful and inspirational to hear you share. One of the key moments during your father's presidency was the American Bicentennial in 1976. And Queen Elizabeth came. Mm -hmm. Memories of that. And during her recent funeral that we all watched, it seems like everybody in the country was watching and admiring the life that she lived, What are your memories of her during that bicentennial occasion? Well, first of all, that was the most incredible state dinner because it was in the Rose Garden under Mm. a tent. Um, I I remember the dress that I had. I wish I still had it. But it was just, she was so lovely and kind Mm. and so much just the normal woman. I mean, she was just like my mom and she had a great sense of humor. She was just really charming and sweet. I didn't spend a huge amount of time with her, but the short time that I did spend with her, she was very sweet. One of the most popular times for people to know about life in the White House is Christmas. And uh, you had, uh, your family had three Christmases in the White House. And this year we are featuring the Ford family in our White House Historical Association Christmas ornament. And as you know, on the front, it has these iconic images of crafts as was the sort of the theme of the of those years, and on the reverse, these elements honoring your father as an Eagle Scout, as a Michigan football player, the Bicentennial, and several other things. Memories of family Christmas in the White House had to be incredibly special. Well, they were, and if I'm not mistaken, I could have them mixed up. I want to say our first Christmas was a Williamsburg Christmas, Mm. because I remember making ornaments with mother and stringing popcorn and cranberries and doing that whole thing. Then there was always the handcrafted, but then the bicentennial were all the trees, if I'm not mistaken, were pretty much red, white, and blue. Mm. I own an ornament that when they took it down, I just kind of slipped it out and it still hangs on my tree. Oh, that's great. That's it's special. a little wooden mouse that had hung on one of the trees. But I was it was an interesting how you all got volunteers and stuff and how people get involved in mm-hmm. making this. It was pretty amazing, and I'm glad they now do shows about it because it's fascinating, and I'm a watcher. 
It is a massive undertaking every year, and planning for the next year began shortly after yep. a Christmas each year. And, yep. and it's one of those things that First Ladies are looked to to preside over, as are the state dinners. Did your mother enjoy being First Lady? Was that a, a role that she embraced? You know, I think once she got over the shock of it, she did embrace it. And I remember her state dinners working with Maria and Nancy, her social secretaries, where she would find out what kind of art the president or prime minister, whoever was visiting, what they liked. I remember, I think it was for Anwar Sadat, where he was very much into Western art. Mm -hmm. And so instead of the standard centerpieces on the tables, which mother went from the, the U-shaped tables to round tables, because she felt it was much better for yeah, conversations. That was a significant transition. It was a big change. Mm -hmm. I don't remember if there was pushback or not, but she had Remingtons as centerpieces mm -hmm. every other table in honor of Mr. President Sadat, mm -hmm. because that was the, the artwork that he mm -hmm. liked. Mm -hmm. um, so she tried to do things differently. I mean, every first lady tries to do That's it right. a little bit differently. I remember going to my first state dinner, and I don't know if it was Carl Albert or who it was, was at my table, and everybody's looking at me. And I didn't realize, nobody told me, that I was the hostess, and they were all waiting for me to start oh. eating. <laughs> the, the, the forks and knives and spoons didn't right. bother me, because I had been to dinners, but everybody was waiting for me, and then I was like, oh, okay, now I understand. <laughs> Other first ladies, during her time as first lady, did your mother interact with other first ladies or reach out to former first ladies and then after the time she was first lady who were some of the first ladies that she interacted with and what were some of those key relationships well you know she and pat nixon had been long friends but lady bird was a dear friend because they had been in the house together and so yes there were other congressional wives or vice presidential wives that she did count on and talk to and, and stay friends with over the years. But her plate was pretty full. Mm. It was pretty full. Between the breast cancer and, and that kind of took off out of nowhere. And then you have to remember, she was a huge supporter of the Equal Rights Amendment, which is still shocking to this day that That's it's right. not passed. Um, kind of sad. But, you know, she ended up having a uh, phone put in to the White House because... Dick Cheney and Don Rumsfeld complained that she was making calls <laughs> from the White House line to the House and Senate members. So she had a private line put she in. She had a private line yes. put in so that they couldn't complain about her using the White House phone to, <laughs> to lobby people up there. So well, that's uh, pretty formidable to go up against Dick Cheney and Don Rumsfeld. That's it was. A... Well, you know, they went to my dad and said, could you talk to her about this? My dad said, no, if you, if, if you don't like it, you go talk to her. <laughs> My mother was an independent woman, so. Do you recall where you were that iconic day when your parents walked the Nixons out uh, to the helicopter and President Nixon flew off and Mrs. Ford came back into the White House and life was changed? Forever. So we were, first we were in EOB, which is the executive office building for people who don't know what EOB is. And then we were moved over to the Oval Office, us children, while mother and dad walked them to the helicopter. And it was a really somber, sad day for, for our country in general. And then we had to gather ourselves together and put smiles on our face and walk up to the East Room for the swearing in because the swearing in had not taken place until they walked them out and put and they got on Marine One. It was a long day and you know, you were up, you were down, you were excited for your dad, but it's not a job he really wanted and and you were sad for the Nixons. I remember going to the White House as a, a young kid for church services. The Nixons would mm -hmm. have church oh, that's services. Right. In the East Room. Yes. In the East Room. And I remember going there with my parents several times. So it was a tough one. And your relationship or interaction with Tricia and Julie Nixon at that time? I had had none. To me, I idolized them. To mm. me, they were like Princess Diana <laughs> <laughs> because I was so young and in middle school, basically most of yes. his administration. 
until I got into high school. So I had not had any. I had met them at the church services mm -hmm. and whatever, but no interaction. Well, Susan, in 1962, Mrs. Kennedy had the White House Historical Association create the guidebook, and that is an iconic <laughs> publication. Now, I think we're in our 26th edition, but you actually were uh, an employee of the White House Historical Association back in the day. Reflect on that for us. I was. I was. My dad was a congressman, so I would have been a sophomore, junior in high school. Sold guidebooks in that little corner. I don't know if that's where they still sell them. Right, close by there. Right? Oh, okay. It was me and a girlfriend, and then we had a boss, and we had to turn in our money and count our money, but it was a great job. I mean, it was a great job for a high school kid. Well, anytime you want to come back and use that experience, we'd be happy to have you. <laughs> the funny part of it was when the Nixons were in-house, there was always the screen up down by the elevator yes. so that they could get out to the front. And when they weren't in the house, the screen wasn't up. So when we moved in, I was like, Mom, I, I know how this works. I mean, I just <laughs> felt like such the cocky little kid, but yeah. I want to touch on a fun time that you and I had had recently. <laughs> uh, your father has had a state-of-the-art brand new aircraft carrier, uh, the USS Gerald R. Ford named for him and you and I were down in Norfolk recently and were aboard this incredible war vessel but peacekeeping vessel as well. Obviously your father didn't know about that particular piece of his legacy but what would he think about that and what, do you, what does that mean to you? Well you know it is pretty amazing. They have been deployed since you and I were there and it was one of the last things that he was told before he passed. He was told about it about six weeks before he passed. Don Rumsfeld flew out and told him. And it was an incredible honor to him mm. because he didn't expect it. I mean, to get an aircraft carrier named after you, much less a class of aircraft carriers to be named after you, is rare. Those sailors who are now deployed and at the air wing that is now out there are our ambassadors. Mm. And they all know the story. You saw the room that talks about right. his life. They now are ambassadors that get to talk about him. And so they're our biggest legacy item out there. Incredibly impressive sailors aboard that ship and crew. And it was really a privilege to be with you on the, the Ford that particular day. I love going on the Ford. I do want to talk with you about one other thing that uh, recently I shared uh, with you that I had the opportunity to speak to the University of Michigan football team. <laughs> and your father was famously a center. He was a backup center on a national championship team. And then the next year he was a team captain of the, as a center on the football team. And when I was talking with these players and the first time I mentioned your father's name, they erupted into this <laughs> chant of go forward, go forward, go forward. And the irony of he was this great athlete but then Chevy Chase and others would make fun of him as if he were some bumbling klutz. How did your father handle that? And what did that time at Michigan and that identity with Michigan mean to him throughout his life? Well, his time at Michigan was very important to him. Um, when you go back and you look at his life history of um, his biological father uh, abusing his mother and and moving to Grand Rapids and changing his name and, you know, that's a whole nother story. So Michigan was a great place for him to discover who he was and, and learn about it. And he loved his teammates and, and football in high school was important to him. And his coach in high school is how he got to Michigan, gave him the money to apply and do all those things that people really cared about him. And so that was important to him. And then there's the whole story of black and blue with the Georgia Tech and when they- Share that story, that's really powerful. Michigan was to play Georgia Tech, this is the 1930s, 33, 34. Um, and my dad's roommate on the road was a gentleman by the name of Willis Ward. And Willis Ward was a black gentleman. Well, Georgia Tech would not allow Willis to go to the game and play because he was black. And my dad got very upset, uh, threatened to quit the team. He didn't quit the team because Willis asked him to go and play. The only game they won, I think I'm right on this, was this game, and they beat Georgia Tech. But it was 
kind of the beginning of my dad's whole thing about race. And I mean, that made such a huge impact on him as a very young man. Michigan is, I love going to a game. It's great fun. Being in the big house, one of my favorite things, um, if you can have a favorite thing about your dad's funeral, was Air Force One went by the big house and tipped the oh, wing. Oh, wow, that's right. And that was a really special moment. Really special. And how did he cope with the, the humor part? Well, the humor part, he just thought it was stupid because he knew he was a good athlete. He played tennis, he played golf, he skied. You know, they needed to find something to make fun of him, and that's how they made fun of him. You know, the cartoonists used to have a Band-Aid on his forehead. If you go back <laughs> yes. and look at the cartoons right. of that era, President Nixon, it was his nose, and my dad, it was a Band-Aid on mm. his forehead. They yeah. have to come up with something. Well, good for him for rising above that. There were two attempts that we know of on mm -hmm. your father's life. How does that, what's the family reaction when something like that happens? Those were really difficult times. Um, the first one, I was at Rehoboth Beach with some girlfriends. We were all getting ready to go off to college. And we were all laying on the beach, and I didn't notice it, but when I got up and went to the water, my Secret Service agents turned off the radio that we had playing at the beach. And we came back, sat on our towels, eventually walked up to the house we were staying in, and Tommy Paps who's since passed, came up to me and he said, Susan, I need to talk to you. And he told me about the first attempt. Well, I was scared to death. All I want to do is talk to my dad. Mm -hmm. Eventually, I did talk to him that night. The second attempt, I was in the White House, up in the solarium, and my agents called me and told me about it. It was just scary. And the thing that my mother kept saying is, they're women. And here I am trying to get mm. the Equal Rights Amendment passed. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to, I'm pro-woman. Why mm. is that happening? Mm. So, I mean, they're very scary. My dad had bulletproof vests that he that were matching his suits. And mother and I chose never to know what suits those were mm. um, because we didn't want to know when he had them on. So it was not fun. What has it been like throughout the course of your life to be the daughter of a president and to know that your father was president of the United States? Well, it's a real honor, but it's this much of my life. Mm -hmm. It was two and a half years. Mm -hmm. So my goal is just to continue their legacy mm -hmm. and talk about them and share my what how they impacted me. Mm -hmm. I mean... <laughs> For instance, I, a, a gal at the gym was like, I saw on Facebook, you have a picture with, with Jerry Ford. How'd you pull that off? <laughs> and I said... Inside connection. <laughs> Inside connection. He's my dad. And she just, the look on her face was right. shocking. So there's a lot of people that don't know, and, I, and I, don't, I don't wear it on my sleeve. I don't... People go, well, why didn't you tell me? And I go, why should I? Mm. What difference does it make? It really mm. doesn't. So I go and do things to honor them, mm -hmm. but it doesn't affect my day-to-day -day life. There would have been no way when you lived in this house where we are today <laughs> that you could have anticipated that one day you would be back here reminiscing and recollecting the times in these rooms and your parents growing up here. That has to be incredibly special now to look at this, from this vantage point and all that has happened and so much that began in this house. It is, um, and I never would have told you growing up in this house that I would have ended up at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, this was my hood. This was, this is where I lived. This is where I grew up, and it's special. How do you want your parents to be remembered? <sighs> um, most of all, for their honesty, integrity, and what they did for the country in a really horrible time. Both my parents. Not just my dad, but both my parents. I will close with the impossible question. Your favorite memory of life in the White House. <sighs> you know, I think it would be 
the dinners around the table. Family dinners. Family around dinners the table. around the table. That and time in the solarium. We would go up there and play cards and games and mm. things like that. The, the normal family mm. things. The food was impeccable. <laughs> uh, it's the best sweet tea you've ever had in your entire life. I never found out what they do to their sweet tea, but it's better than anybody's. And just just the fun. I mean, there was lots of there was lots of laughter. Of course, there was much sadness, mm -hmm. but there was also lots of laughter. And wow. that's, that's the best part. Well, thank you for sharing a family memory in the White House is your favorite memory there. And thank you for coming back to this home, this house, uh, where you came to right out of the hospital when you were born. Yep. And you left here and went to the White House. And, <laughs> big change. Uh, big change. So it's been very special to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you all for listening and watching today. I've had the great privilege to bring you stories like the one here today since the program began in 2017. You can listen to the dozens of interviews I've done over the years on your favorite podcast provider, or you can watch them on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. All of us here at the White House Historical Association, thank you for your support. When you become an association member, or when you purchase a book, or an official White House Christmas ornament, you are helping to fund our education mission through teacher programming, publishing, and even this podcast. You can learn more about our work as a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization by going to our website, whitehousehistory.org. Thank you very much. Thank you.